So, um, we'll just start out, we're gonna just, just a few caveats in terms of how we approach the pharmacologic treatment of pain. Some of this is gonna be really obvious for y'all and that's great, um, but again, I, I think it, it's really helpful from the perspective of just uh, helping us think about what we're doing when we prescribe drugs uh, for, for pain. Now, it might seem uh, obvious to say, well, we would uh, select the appropriate analgesic drug. Um, I think that um, we have learned through the decades that we haven't always been that thoughtful about it. We've been influenced, and I say we, because uh, my, you know, my pain management goes back four decades. And so I have uh, the opportunity to have been influenced by drug reps uh, who have pushed various uh, concepts and various specific drugs. Um, we see less of that now than we did before, but, but still, think about the, the most appropriate analgesic drug for the type of pain that the patient has. And that's why it was so important about talking about how we evaluate pain last week. Uh, I, I subscribe to a concept of monotherapy, and that means that we just want to make sure that uh, one drug at a time and then push that to the max. Uh, one drug, if you can, for long-acting and the same molecule for short-acting. So long-acting morphine, short-acting morphine. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I think the body likes that better. I don't have any scientific evidence to prove that. Uh, I had you know, someone show up in a clinic once with on seven different opioids all at entry level doses, most of which were combination drugs. The patient felt crappy, he had a lot of pain, and so we wanted to make sure we were consolidating that into one opioid that made sense. He also, by the way, was taking a total of 13 grams of uh, acetaminophen a day uh, by virtue of not only his uh, uh, combination drugs, his Darvacet, his, um, his Norco, um, and his Percocet, but he was also taking uh, uh, exercise Tylenol on its own and a, and a Tylenol containing allergy pill. So, anyway, so monotherapy, one drug and then push it. I think that what happens is a lot of physicians feel a little uncomfortable with increased doses. Um, and so they just flip to another one rather than, or adding another one rather than uh, ex expanding on the capabilities of the one drug that we are giving. Uh, appropriate dose. Um, this is not necessarily a one size fits all. It might be a, a you know, one, one size starts all, um, but to, uh, you, you need to look at the patient, look at their underlying uh, disease, look at the level of their pain, and then prescribe the appropriate dose and by the appropriate route. And this is just a big one. Uh, oral is preferred, unless they're in crisis, in which case you can give uh, IV or sub -Q. And uh, this, is, uh, this is, again, something I've seen uh, time and time again where someone, for example, uh, shows up at uh, their doctor's, their dentist, they have pain, and they're, they're uh, slapped on uh, uh, a patch of, uh, of, the, of um, fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is not a good drug uh, by transdermal route to initiate or titrate um, pain. It's good if you have someone who has difficulty swallowing, has difficulty in terms of managing oral medications, once you know what the appropriate opioid dose is, then to switch, the, uh, switch them over to the uh, patch. But to start it doesn't make a lot of sense always. Uh, schedule the appropriate dosing interval. Again, that sounds a little bit um, lame, but, uh, but you'd be surprised how many people will use long-acting drugs with short-acting dosage intervals. Uh, or, you know, kind of my favorite, someone in the hospital will be given an IV dose of, uh, of an opioid, say, uh, dilaudid or morphine, uh, you know, one milligram of, uh, of, of morphine Q four hours PRN. And the question I typically ask to the resident or the medical student there is, okay, what's the, you know, what's the time to peak effect of that IV? Well, the time to peak effect is about, you know, 15 minutes. And the, the therapeutic effect of that pain is going to be starting to wane within about, you know, 45 minutes, within an hour for sure. And what are you going to do for this patient's pain within that one to three hours and one to four hours before they're do for another dose. We force our patients to suffer. So uh, dosing interval is really, really critical. Uh, our goal is to prevent persistent pain and really breakthrough pain. So we want to titrate aggressively. And uh, we've got a wonderful lecture coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks about, uh, about pain crisis and IV uh, pain uh, therapies. And so they'll talk more about that. We want to uh, prevent, anticipate, and manage side effects. I've got uh, a slide on that in just a little bit. And consider a sequential trial of opioid analgesics. If someone's not tolerating something well, uh, if we've made a couple of titrations and it's not effective, 
then we need to consider switching to a different opioid, not piling on, but switching to a different one. Uh, use appropriate co-analgesic drugs. Uh, we have patients that have complex pain and it uh, arises from different sources and understanding how, when, and why to use these co-analgesics, these adjuvants is really, really important. We always want to consider the patient's current opioid exposure when we are initiating the, the care that we're going to be providing. Uh, we, we can't start from scratch. We need, to, we need to appreciate the fact that there may be some element of tolerance that has developed in response to the opioids that they're currently on. It really is kind of the cornerstone of cancer pain management. It doesn't need to be the cornerstone of all pain management. The cancer pain management, we see that a lot. And uh, since we are really expected to be the experts on this, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, various substances, uh, drugs, and approaches to pharmacologic uh, uh, management throughout the course of the fellowship program here. It must be individualized. We can't cookie cutter this. And it must be as simple and non-invasive as possible. Uh, we must use equi-analgesic tables. And, and I, I just kind of put this extra bullet. Addiction and tolerance to opioid analgesics really is quite unusual. Uh, it happens for sure. We need to be able to identify that. And we've got, again, some other approaches and, uh, and, and identifiers that we'll talk about as we course through both today and our program here. Appropriate dose is based on pain intensity, current analgesic therapy. Again, no optimal dose, no one maximal dose. Um, I think that uh, it's, you know, you, opioids are unique. Uh, there isn't a ceiling beyond which you can't go further. Uh, the appropriate dose is that which relieves pain throughout the dosing interval without unmanageable side effects. So it's okay to continue to titrate if you continue to get relief of pain uh, without the side effects. Want to prevent uh, daily uh, prevent pain recurrence and minimize the number of daily doses. We want to make this easy on our patients. Uh, and it really depends on the opioid and the route as far as what that interval is going to be. Uh, but just remember, short acting or short acting, we shouldn't be trying to control uh, chronic pain with short acting opioids. We see that all the time. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, of thoughts in the field that some of the issue of the opioid uh, epidemic that we're seeing um, has been fostered by too many people having chronic pain managed with short acting opioids. They'll be put on a Norco or something of that nature or oxy. Uh, the short acting uh, oxycodone uh, for their pain, and, uh, and that's an issue. Uh, look for how the patients are responding to the dose that you're giving uh, and, and manage the interval by identifying end of dose failure. So, this is a busy slide, and you don't have to look. There, there, I want to just point out a couple of things with this. Uh, left column is just various classes. And this is not at all exhaustive, but I just wanted to kind of highlight just a few things about it. And in the middle is just a mechanism of action. I think if, if you remember from last week, we had a, uh, you know, we had a diagram showing that, uh, you know, you, you get a paper cut and there's this channel that, uh, that that pain traverses, you know, through the periphery into the uh, uh, spinal cord up to the, um, up to the brain. And there are opportunities to intervene at any one of those points or all of those points, depending upon the nature of the pain. So understanding the mechanism of action is important. We also talked last week, um, I spent a little time talking about the challenges that we see uh, with the uh, cortical or cognitive impact on how patients see pain. And that's really important when we start considering our therapies. I'm going to start right at the top with uh, acetaminophen. It is an oxy uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor. It prevents prostaglandin production. And so in that way, it works not, not too differently from the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, I want to just, just affirm that acetaminophen is a very effective analgesic agent. And yet our patients don't believe that because we as physicians don't believe that. And we don't sell it as an effective analgesic. We have a tendency to, to, to sell it as um, something that, well, it's over the counter, it's inexpensive, it's weak, so you can try this. And if it doesn't work, then we'll get to the good stuff. We need to begin thinking about this and selling it to our patients as good stuff, because it is good stuff. 
And just a couple of examples. Uh, some of you may have had a similar experience in which uh, you know, a patient has come in, uh, they had been on Norco, the doctor felt uncomfortable with Norco, so switched to Oxy, and the Oxy doesn't work. Uh, and so they come to you and you take a look, well, they were on, you know, uh, oxycodone five milligram tablets, they were on Norco, which is hydrocodone five milligrams and 325 of acetaminophen. And it's really quite revealing when I tell them, I said, well, if the Norco works, but the Oxy doesn't, the explanation of that is that it's the acetaminophen that is doing the work of your pain, but that's great news for you because we can use that instead of having to keep you on an opioid for your pain. Um, I tend to be a little wimpy when it comes to pain. Um, I was in the hospital for major surgery here about six years ago and uh, uh, was able to control my post-operative, my post-thoracotomy pain with uh, Tylenol alone. They gave me some moxie to go home, gave me 42 tablets. I think I still have 40 left. I should probably throw them away because they're six years old, but um, not that I'm a hoarder, but, uh, but, I, uh, but I, was, I was thankful to be able to get effective relief of fairly significant pain from acetaminophen. And I think it's important that we, we continue to promote this as a very, very effective uh, analgesic. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to, with confidence, add that to the regimen or start the regimen with that saying, yeah, this, this can work for that. If you've got a highly inflammatory pain, for example, bone metastases, you're going to need more than that. But it's a good, it's a good adjuvant and sometimes a good starter. The non-steroidals, again, provide a little bit better uh, cyclooxygenase and inhibition and therefore uh, more punch in terms of the inflammatory type pains. We're going to talk more about opioids, so I'm not going to spend time on this slide uh, with that particular bullet. Uh, methadone, we've got a specific lecture coming up for that shortly. Uh, and you'll learn all you need to know about that. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful opioid that, that we, uh, we need to be very, very comfortable with in our field. I love steroids. Uh, again, potent uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, plus, within our field, uh, they produce uh, a number of, uh, of subsidiary benefits. Uh, it helps with appetite, helps with energy. Um, uh, it helps with uh, sometimes cognitive sharpness. It, it just there's a lot of different things that steroids do that we you know that we that we like. Uh, it helps with nausea, for example. Uh, so you'll see that prescribed along the way, and it's always in the back of my mind: is this a type of pain that might benefit from uh, either a short course or a low dose of uh, of steroids to help? Uh, tricyclic antidepressants uh, have been you know in in the past the the sinequinone for a neuropathic pain before we had the uh, uh, anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, they inhibit the sodium channels on the neurons, and they do increase noradic, or noradrenergic and certain serotonergic inhibitory pain pathways. Uh, very, very effective. Um, they have a fairly uh, a prominent side effect profile, which makes it a bit challenging, especially in the elderly, uh, the dizziness, the uh, um, anticholinergic side effects, um, so we need to be careful about it. And because of that, we don't use them so much anymore, but you need to be aware of them. And uh, uh, amitriptyline and uh, tisipramine are probably the two most common that we've used. The SNRIs are becoming into a little bit more prominence in terms of their capacity to help with uh, especially neuropathic pain. Uh, again, for the similar ways that the tricyclics work, uh, duloxetine, which is um, Cymbalta, you see direct uh, consumer advertising on TV a lot for that. Uh, just This is just personally, I have been a little bit underwhelmed with their capacity as a single agent for managing various types of pain, but I've found that they can be effective uh, adjuvants. And uh, particularly if, if folks uh, have some element of depression, anxiety, things of that sort, um, then, then you can capitalize on the the benefits that they might have in terms of helping to treat those things. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of slides later on with the gabapentinoids, so we'll talk about those in just a bit, but those really are the uh, probably primary drugs that we now use uh, when neuropathic pain is implicated. Um, and uh, so that's really good to keep in mind. Uh, local anesthetics, lidocaine, 
Uh, I put that in there because, uh, again, it's a sodium channel inhibition, and we're all probably familiar with the cane products. It might be some lidocaine when you've had stitches done or some other local procedure, something removed, uh, or uh, the novocaine that the dentist uses on your, uh, you know, on your gums. Uh, and it's very, very effective, but it can also be used not only uh, intradermal, but, but of course topically to have now the, the, the lidocaine patches. And uh, we use IV lidocaine, and there's a, there's a good body of, uh, of evidence out there of the effectiveness of uh, intravenous lidocaine. Again, probably primarily for neuropathic pain, but other types of chronic pain and generalized pain syndromes. And it can be very effective in opioid sparing when given as an IV infusion. That can be done intermittently or can be done over a continuous period of time. So just to give you an idea of the scope of the types of drugs that we have uh, with them. For us, opioids are probably where we find our, uh, our, our home. That's what we are known for being able to be effective at providing, and a lot of people will consult us because they want us uh, to help manage the opioid uh, um, needs of the patients. Uh, there are full agonists, partial agonists, and antagonists. Uh, analgesics exert their pharmacologic effect by binding to specific receptors inside and outside the central nervous system. And that's important to keep in mind. They can occur throughout the central nervous system, but particularly in areas and tracts associated with pain perception. They're also located in some sensory nerves on mast cells and in, uh, and in some cells of the GI tract. And those last two are really important uh, because when people have side effects of opioids uh, on, the, uh, on the GI tract, they can get nausea and they can get constipation. You should assume that they will get constipation. Well, the hand that writes the opioid prescription does the disimpaction. Keep that in mind. That's just a good rule to, to, to keep in mind. And on the mast cells, when uh, some folks, uh, when they take an opioid, it activates those mast cells and releases a lot of histamine. They get a lot of itching. That is not an allergy. That is just the mast cell degranulation that they get. So just keep in mind that those receptors are everywhere. Uh, the opioids can be uh, categorized as endogenous, endorphins, and keflins, and dynorphins. And I think we talked about the endorphins uh, released last week um, as part of what uh, uh, might influence uh, a patient's response to uh, drug administration even before it pharmacologically can take effect. Uh, there are the opium alkaloids, such as morphine codeine. We have semi-synthetic, such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, hydromorphone that are derived from uh, thebane, T-H-E-B-A-I-N-E. I thought I had that up there, but I don't. Uh, and then totally synthetic, tramadol, methadone, and fentanyl. And part of what we're seeing with the uh, opioid crisis that's kind of enveloped a uh, segment of our society is this ability to synthetically make fentanyl and fentanyl analogs uh, that has uh, become very, very problematic and tragic for a lot of families. So we have uh, three opioid receptors, the mu, the cap, the delta. For our purposes, the mu is always going to be the most important. Um, it's associated with analgesia, respiratory depression, however, is a, is a challenge, meiosis, euphoria, and reduced gastrointestinal uh, motility. I'm not going to talk much about the kappas and the deltas uh, today, but just know that they exist, know that there is uh, work out there to try to determine uh, whether some of those might um, uh, be, you know, might have some role in uh, you know, kind of designer drugs down the line. Um, there are some kappa receptor drugs that are used, for example, for intrathecal use. Um, that tends to be outside of our realm of comfort and uh, more in the realm of, uh, of the interventionalists. But mu receptors are typically where it's at. Busy slide again, but, but there's, there's a, a very uh, important point here. Um, all of these five classes are considered opioids because they attach to the um, uh, mu opioid receptor. That makes them an opioid. But you can see that they're chemically are very, very different. Uh, starting from the right side, tramadol, which is in the phenylpropylamine category, uh, really just has uh, tramadol. It does have uh, dependadol, but I've never prescribed that. I don't know where or how or how available it is, but 
it is, uh, it is uh, on the list of available drugs. Uh, next to that is methadone, uh, which is methadone, uh, diphenylheptane. Uh, Propoxyphene is in that family as well, but that is no longer available in the United States. Uh, older folks remember Darvon, Darvacet, uh, which was propoxyphene. Uh, no longer available, um, but you'll have older folks coming in sometimes asking for it. Um, a paradine, uh, Demerol, uh, which uh, is, is in the phenylpapyridine category, and, and even though they refer to that as the mepiridine family, you'll look at that and see it's uh, fentanyl and all of its relatives. You've got REM and SU and AL and uh, uh, are all part of that. And now it's some R fentanyls and all these new fentanyl uh, analogs that are being developed. Uh, Pentazosine, uh, which is unusual, the, 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 the diphenoxylene loperamide pentazosine, the first two being uh, primarily uh, related to uh, as, as anti-diarrheal drugs because they will attach the mu, mu receptors in the gut and that makes them effective at, um, uh, at relieving uh, diarrhea but uh, they unfortunately don't really cross the blood brain barrier so it doesn't make them very effective for pain. So that leaves us with the first line which is everything else that we uh, that we're familiar with uh, with respect to opioids. It is the phenanthrene category, and if you just kind of browse, browse through it, you'll see you've got everything from um, uh, you know, from morphine and uh, hydromorphone, um, which is lauded. You've got oxycodone, oxymorphone, and uh, you have um, heroin. All, all of these are <laughs> phenanthrenes. The reason that I that I put this up here is that. Um, if you've got someone who is getting a, a, a specific side effect or an actual allergy to one of the opioids, you want to you want to switch categories, uh, switch the family. And if you just think of the fact that you've got tramadol in one, methadone in one, fentanyl in one, and everything else is related, uh, if someone is having a bad reaction to a hydrocodone, switching to oxycodone may not make a lot of sense for you. Uh, switching to fentanyl might. Switching to um, uh, methadone might. So uh, it's just, a, it's again, a philosophy that you have to adopt and understand uh, the relationship of these drugs to one another. Their metabolism is different. Um, you know, for example, the uh, phenanthrenes uh, undergo glucuronidation. The uh, metabolites can be both neurotoxic and are excreted by the kidney. So if someone has kidney failure, then uh, you could have more problem with side effects with the phenanthrenes. Uh, methadone and fentanyl do not have such of a glucuronidation process that is, that is toxic. So someone with, with renal failure, you may want to be leaning more toward fentanyl and methadone uh, families. So just, uh, you know, if you've got some time, just, just think about that and study that. So you just have it ingrained in your mind that we have these different families of, of methadone or of uh, opioids. We always need to do um, opioid conversions um, uh, when we've got patients in. And this is one of the errors that I, I see all the time that is uh, frustrating to me. Uh, and it can be simple like someone, you know, you're, you're taking a bedside history and well, I don't want that methadone or that morphine because that morphine never works. I want the dilaudid because it's allowed it always works. And you start looking at the MAR and you see, well, they got a milligram of morphine and a milligram of Dilaudid. Well, of course the Dilaudid is working. You just gave four times the dose. Um, in this particular uh, chart, and this uh, comes out of, uh, this is directly out of uh, Marilyn McPherson's uh, conversion book. Um, she's more generous uh, uh, with the strength of the hydromorphone on that about six to one. I've seen uh, various times. So um, I, I tend to be a little more conservative and use four to one on the IVs. Uh, PO dose is four to one. The, uh, in general, uh, you'll see that from the morphine, we have the IV to PO is uh, three to one on the morphine and the hydromorphone is uh, about, five, can be as much as five to one. Um, so you, you don't need to memorize this chart. You will, over time, um, learn that uh, yep, hydrocodone 
oxycodone, both oral agents are equivalent uh, milligram per milligram, and that's fairly close to the morphine, maybe just a little bit more. Hydromorphone is maybe four times as uh, potent, and then uh, you've got uh, tramadol, which is um, 10 times less potent. Um, and fentanyl, uh, we put the rule of thumb is that 100 microgram patch is equal to 200 milligrams per day of oral morphine. Um, so, so anyway, this is um, this is a this is a good chart just to kind of you know have at your at your fingertips. There are a number of different uh, conversion charts that you can download onto your phone. Uh, plug in the dose that the patient's on if you're if you're going to be converting. One of the concepts that we need to think about also is uh, cross tolerance, uh, and that is if someone's been on morphine for a while, you want to switch them to uh, uh, to Dilaudid, for example. Uh, it may not take as much Dilaudid. Uh, because uh, there may be some uniquenesses of the Dilaudid that might make them more sensitive to that. So we don't always necessarily do a straight conversion, but then lower it uh, by anywhere from, again, 25 maybe to 50 percent for what we refer to as incomplete cross tolerance. So it's a little bit safer way of doing that, and then you can rapidly titrate from there. So. Uh, just keep in mind the, the need for uh, opioid conversion. That's what that is. Um, we talked about this already, uh, you know, use oral formulations if possible. Uh, I'm gonna skip, skip ahead here. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk more uh, specifically. Uh, no patient should ever wish for death because of a physician's reluctance to use adequate amounts of effective opioids. Uh, that was from my pharmacology text, Goodman and Gilman, that I used in medical school. And um, I think that that ethic still is relevant today. So morphine, its use was documented well over three millennia ago. It was uh, ultimately isolated in 1804, distributed in 1817, sold commercially in 1827. This drug's been around for a long, long time. And it is named after the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus. It was more widely used after the introduction of the hypodermic needle in 1957. It is the most prevalent of uh, greater than 50 naturally occurring alkaloids in, op in, in opium. So it is a, it is a pure um, uh, opioid. Um, the alternative species of poppy produce thebane, which are used in the semi-synthetic production of hydromorphone, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. The human body produces the endorphins, we talked about those before, endogenous morphines, which bind to the receptors as well. Binds very strong to the mu receptors. Um, so you have a little bit higher incidence of euphoria and dysphoria, respiratory depression, sedation, pruritus, tolerance, and physical and psychological dependence when compared to other opioids at equianalgesic doses. One of the benefits of morphine is that you, there's a lot of different ways you can give it. You can give it orally, um, you can give it rectally, you can give it sub-Q, you can give it IV, you can give it intrafecal, you can give it epidural. So there's a lot of different ways that you can give morphine. Not all opioids have that capacity to be able to switch back and forth to different uh, forms. Uh, and it does also hit the cap in the deltas. Associated with spinal action, analgesia, meiosis, and psychomedic effects also. Um, and uh, the, uh, as we mentioned, the kappa is thought to play a role in analgesia as well. Uh, it is subject to an extensive first attack pass metabolism. I alluded to that just a little bit earlier. Um, and plasma levels after you give it sub-Q, IM, and IV are comparable. Uh, with IM, it takes a little bit longer and it hurts a little bit more. So for that reason, I don't often use IM. I'm typically using IV if we've got a pain crisis, uh, if they have a site and if they don't have a, an IV site, sub-Q is perfectly acceptable. Uh, after injection, uh, the plasma levels peak in about 20 minutes. So when we talk about time to peak effect, that's when it kicks in. Right when, when the when the patient can feel pain relief, there is then the peak of plasma level, and then there is the peak in in effectiveness in terms of how long it's going to last. Not really peak, but how long it's going to last and provide analgesia. 
Um, oral administration, you would, as you would expect, peaks a little bit later than the IV. And again, it is metabolized in the liver, um, but approximately 80%, 87% is excreted in the urine. I mentioned this earlier, the glucuronization. It's important that you remember that for the fellows, there will be a question on the boards relative to morphine metabolism and kidney function. There almost always is. Uh, so the MG, the M3G does not undergo opioid receptor binding and has no analgesic effect. It is neurotoxic. And so when you have uh, patients that start twitching and start uh, showing you some element of neurotoxicity, it is because you've got this M3G that's building up in the system. M6G will bind to the mu receptors and is uh, actually milligram per milligram more potent than actual morphine. Elimination of half-life of morphine, approximately two hours. It can be stored in fat, and therefore it can be detectable uh, even after death. Uh, there's no, they've not been able to correlate the amount that they're measuring in fat tissue. Um, the coroner sometimes will, uh, they can find it in vitreous fluid, and that's a little more stable. It's able to cross the blood-brain barrier, but doesn't cross easily. So the diacetylmorphine, which is heroin, uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier a whole lot easier, making it more potent, and which is why it's, as an abusable drug, a little bit more attractive, because it gets in easier and gives a, a quicker and more effective high. Tramadol. Um, the effectiveness of tramadol, we mentioned it's about one-tenth of, uh, of uh, morphine. Uh, fairly similar to codeine. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of tramadol. I think it works okay, uh, but because it is, uh, it is fairly weak, um, you need a pretty good dose of that. And the, the bigger the, the dose number, then the greater the likelihood that you could get some element of side effects. And because they've tended to focus this on the elderly, I'm, I'm less, um, I'm less enamored with it, but it can be very effective and if, they, and if patients tolerate it, uh, then it's perfectly uh, acceptable to use. But just keep in mind that because it's weak, doesn't mean that it's not an opioid, which I've, I've seen that error. Docs don't think it's an opioid because it's weak. Um, and they don't appreciate that it still has dependency, tolerance, addiction, potential. So it's, um, yeah, there we are. Uh, opioids for moderate pain, uh, these are the ones that, um, you know, you've, you've done your step one and tried the, uh, the, the non-opioids, the, the um, acetaminophen and uh, non-steroidals and such. Uh, they're limited to treatment of mild to moderate pain, but they have dose-limiting side effects. These are the fixed combinations with uh, acetaminophen or aspirin. Uh, there are three basic ones that we have in this category. There are others, but these are the ones that are most commonly used, uh, codeine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone. Uh, hydrocodone in our area, uh, under the brand name uh, Norco Vicodin, is probably the most common that we see. And it's a good drug. It works well. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a short-acting opioid, and, a, and it works fairly effectively. And so if you need something for a short period of time, it's, it's a good way to go. It's a good idea to have a, you know, kind of a, a, a go-to, uh, uh, you know, step two opioid in your pocket and a you know, your first choice uh, step three opioid also. So um, codeine is a prodrug. It's converted to morphine by the CYP2D6. Uh, uh, we have in, uh, you know, in the United States any one to two ultra metabolizers, which means they chew that stuff up really, really quickly. And we have <clears throat> perhaps as many as 20% that are intermediate or poor metabolizers, which means that if you give them uh, a Tylenol codeine, they're, they're not going to get as much analgesic benefit from the codeine itself. Uh, they'll get analgesic from the uh, acetaminophen. But because of that, uh, I'm, I'm fairly reluctant to, uh, to use codeine much. I might still, on great occasion, if someone says they, it's been their, <clears throat> their go-to for a long time when they needed a PRN analgesic, I will still consider that, but um, hydrocodone is, is, is my go-to step two. 
Uh, codeine, you get a lot of dysphoria, nausea, constipation. So this is one that I tend to go to. It's uh, less toxic codeine. Again, upper titration of all of these is limited by the fixed combination with the acetaminophen, not the hydrocodone. If they need more opioid, then don't give a combination drug because you can only give so much of that uh, because of the limitations of, uh, of acetaminophen. Um, oxycodone is also um, associated with uh, acetaminophen as a step two uh, opioid. Um, and uh, again, I can't tell you the last time I prescribed this. If I want them to have oxycodone, I'll give them straight oxycodone and straight uh, Tylenol. Our most common step three opioids for moderate to severe pain are morphine, oxycodone, uh, hydromorphone, or dilaudid, and, and uh, fentanyl. Uh, I mentioned before methadone, that is on the list, but we're gonna have a separate lecture for that specifically. Uh, morphine, it's the most common, uh, common step three opioid that you're gonna use. Multiple forms, as I mentioned, you know, oral, rectal, IV, sub-Q, uh, epidural, intrathecal. Uh, the contr controlled release morphine, you need to be, be familiar with the, uh, with the dosing of this uh, and the fact that the long acting cannot be cut, crushed, or chewed. And that's a mistake that some patients will make, families will make, and even some doctors break it in half. I mean, you really can't do that. You lose the, uh, the long acting moiety and, uh, and they get a big rush of short acting stuff. Uh, it comes in the 15, 30, 60, 100, and 200. Uh, so you can get it in pretty good doses. Cadian is a brand name of a capsular form of this where you have a lot of little teeny tiny time capsules uh, in there. Uh, you can pop that open and uh, with care and diligence, flush it down a feeding tube if need be. So if you've got some that can't swallow, you really want them on morphine instead of a patch, uh, then Cadian uh, is, is not a bad way to go. You should be aware that that sort of thing exists. Oxycodone, very similar to using the uh, fast-acting morphine. Uh, they're both available in liquid forms at 20 milligrams per ml. They can be given sublingual, but, but don't delude yourself into thinking that it's absorbed sublingually. It's not. It's absorbed, uh, you give it sublingual and it just trickles down the gullet and is absorbed uh, in the stomach you know, where it is then metabolized by the liver. So, um, but it's a very, very effective way of treating folks that have difficulty swallowing um, and, uh, and can be given um, uh, in very, very small doses and patients and families feel comfortable administering those uh, liquid formulations. Uh, controlled release oxycodone or oxycontin is the brand name, uh, which is still the only way you can get controlled release oxycodone. It's very expensive and uh, uh, well, insurance may cover it. I would always think twice about, do we need to be given oxycontin or can we be using um, uh, uh, extended release morphine uh, instead? Um, uh, hydromorphone or dilaudid is a really excellent drug. It's, uh, it's more concentrated. It has four times potency of morphine generally. And it also has six times the solubility. So if you've got someone who is, uh, you've been titrating on parenteral um, and the dose is going up uh, on the morphine, uh, you can switch to this and, and have a, a significant fluid advantage of not getting the fluids in with this. Uh, you do have IV sub Q PO, but the PO is only short acting. Uh, there is a long-acting version of this available, but it's it's uh, you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get it. Um, you you prescribe directly to the uh, pharmaceutical company; they dispense directly to the patient. And there's a lot of forms that uh, you have to fill out to make that happen. Very expensive. I've never prescribed it. Um, haven't needed to, quite frankly. If we need someone on a long-acting oral agent. Um, you know, we've got good, good options available to us just through the long-acting morphine, long-acting oxy if you need it, and of course, fentanyl patches. I mentioned paradine Demerol is still on the formulary of hospitals within our, uh, within our community. Um, byproduct is nor noriparidine, uh, and the half-life of that is much longer than meparidine. It has a very significant neuroexcitatory effect. And toxicity is seen when administered over a long period of time, 
or in patients with renal insufficiency, or just when the dose is too high. I saw a very tragic case of a, uh, of a patient who had been given uh, post, uh, postpartum, was having a headache, and was given Demerol 100 milligrams uh, TID for the headache within a couple of days. I uh, was complaining of uh, twitching and nausea and was told over the phone to keep taking it. Within two days, she was dead, and it was from uh, normal period and toxicity. Tragic. And uh, I, I haven't prescribed this in probably 25 years. Uh, there is still a role for the IV form in the hospital, and so I think that having it available is, is useful. Um, but we don't have much use for that within our palliative community at this uh, at this moment in time. I mentioned earlier the transdermal fentanyl. It's uh, you know easy to use for sure. Don't need to remember to take oral meds. Uh, difficult when using high doses of narcotics. It really has never been validated over 300 microgram total um, per dose. Uh, it it exerts its effect by. Um, uh, creating a subcutaneous depot of fentanyl. And then that leaches into the circulation over the next two to three days. And I say two to three days, it's uh, you know, generally we give this every 72 hours, but there's a subset of the population. I don't, I can't tell you what the percentage is, 15%, 20, maybe 25% that are more rapid metabolizers. And, and they, their third day, they're hurting. And if you've got a consistent history like that, it's okay to do it every 42 hours, I'm sorry, 48 hours rather than every 72 hours. Uh, again, very difficult in patients with little subcutaneous tissue, they can't create that depot and it gets sucked right into the system. So uh, be, be aware of that when using that. There are short acting fentanyl products. Uh, you can get them compounded actually, nasal sprays. Uh, Actique uh, was kind of a famous lollipop that became problematic because it looked like a lollipop and if you get got a hold of it, then uh, bad things happen. It's uh, very lipophilic. Um, uh, the, the Fentora is a, is a effervescent uh, dissolvable tablet that you can put between your cheek and gum and it uh, very, very rapidly absorbs the buccal mucosa, which gives you uh, a peak effect, not that dissimilar to IV, quite frankly. A lot of concern when this came out that this could foster um, challenges within the uh, uh, addiction uh, community because of how quickly it's absorbed and the potential for getting a high off of that. Uh, we don't use much of this. Uh, if, if I need um, a uh, short acting fentanyl, then we'll have our friend um, uh, you know, Dave Miller over at Keystone Pharmacy compounds some uh, intranasal fentanyl. We can use it that way. Again, keep in mind that there are several fentanyl analogs. These are all much more potent uh, by factors of 10 to 20 than fentanyl. Uh, I've used um, sufentanyl. And uh, when I've used that, it's because we've had someone on fentanyl uh, infusions and either because of uh, drug availability or because of dosing, we've had to reduce the dose. We had to go to one of these more concentrated uh, so we could uh, reduce the volume of fluid going into the patient. Um, oh, I just realized that I had uh, inserted uh, the, the last chart you saw for opioid conversion um, was, uh, was from Stanford. This is uh, Marilyn McPherson's. Um, oh have to fix my slide deck before I post it. But, uh, but this is essentially what we saw before in terms of just conversions here. There's a few other opioids that I just think it's important to be aware of. Buprenorphine, you'll have a specific lecture on. Methadone, another lecture on that. And there's a bunch of others out there. Stadol, Opana, but these are the brand names, Lucent and Nubain. Um, uh, Tom and Darwin, I keep on the list because um, uh, older patients may ask for it. Uh, these are out there. I have not found a place for them in my armamentarium other than the buprenorphine and the methadone. But people will ask about some of them. 
Some are uh, still advertised and some are still promoted by drug reps. So you just need to be aware that they're out there and they have a role in, uh, in the system. Um, I just have not found a place for them in my practice. Doesn't mean they're not good or valid and I, that's, my, that's my disclaimer. But the buprenorphine and methadone, absolutely. Opioid uh, side effects, uh, certainly euphoria uh, is something that people sometimes are concerned about and others kind of hope for it, but uh, that typically doesn't occur as often as you think it might um, with uh, perhaps with IV doses, excess doses. Constipation, I mentioned earlier, you must presume that anyone receiving an opioid will become constipated and that will not accommodate with time. So they need to be on a bowel regimen. If you uh, you know, if you can't poop, nothing's good. So you just need to make sure that, that that's gonna be a constant uh, issue for you and your patients. Um, and just don't, don't push that so far into the background that you forget about the importance of uh, managing constipation from the beginning. Don't wait until they get bound up, but start giving them a bowel motility agent is the most the, 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 the biggest issue with uh, with opioid induced constipation is bowel motility. So uh, a lot of times people will give a a softening agent along with a motility agent. Um, if you give just a stool softener, then they've got a bunch of soft stuff not going anywhere. And if you give the motility agent with a softening agent, you might be able to get stuff moving, but it can be kind of messy. So always start with uh, just plain Senna. It's simple, it's over the counter, it's cheap, it's easy to get, and it, you can give one, two, three, four, six, you can give as many days as you need to get things moving. But always treat the constipation. Respiratory depression, uh, I think is what we fear because that's what kills people. Um, within a controlled environment that we provide our patients, this is really, really, really rare. And I just wanna emphasize that. Respiratory depression within our um, area doesn't happen much. We might see it with, uh, uh, in patients who are given a high dose and they're opioid naive, we might see it, uh, I've seen it in one patient um, who was maintained on, uh, on their oral morphine at 300 milligrams a day, hospital setting, and the medicine was not changed um, after surgery to remove the painful stimulus. So when you remove pain, uh, you don't need the, the, the morphine anymore. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but generally in speaking, the way that we manage it, the way that we titrate it, respiratory depression, uh, you know, you see postoperatively maybe, uh, but, uh, but we can be fairly comfortable uh, with uh, our oral medications and how we manage those within the outpatient setting. Hypotension, again, generally with IV doses, confusion, delirium, more so in the elderly or with excess doses. Nausea is actually a fairly common adverse effect when someone is initiated on opioids. Uh, very easy to treat. Uh, my questions to folks always when they report a side effect is, um, you know, how's the pain? If the pain is effectively managed, we know that the, that the nausea will be transient and we can treat that effectively. Same with the lethargy and lethar sedation. Sometimes that's due to uh, the, um, the, uh, the opioid itself. Sometimes it's due to the fact that the patient has not had good sleep for days or weeks because of the pain. You've now been effective at relieving the pain and they just want to sleep and uh, they feel good about that. But be aware that that uh, tends to be a, a short term effect. If it persists, then you may need to look at dose reduction. I mentioned earlier that opioids are good uh, mast cell degranulators and can cause itching. Uh, it almost always is transient and can be effectively managed with an antihistamine. Just a couple of fears. I already touched on this, the, uh, the fear of respiratory depression. Uh, fears of addiction. Uh, we're going to have uh, some great lectures uh, a little bit later in the year 
uh, about uh, substance use disorder and addiction. And the one thing that I just want to just uh, emphasize, and I'll reemphasize it again, is that we don't create addicts by the way that we manage our patients' pain. It is exceedingly rare that we would somehow trigger someone who did not have an addictive uh, potential uh, to become an addict on the basis of the uh, of, of what we're doing. Now, that being said, we need to be very thoughtful and considerate about how we are prescribing opioids. Um, the, the issue of how we manage opioids, for example, in uh, non-malignant pain. We also have a great opportunity in, in helping people who have been on opioids and maybe shouldn't be, how to help them uh, get off of them and how to transition them into a more effective uh, pain regimen for whatever is going on. Again, rapid tolerance is, I think, uh, an exaggerated fear. And regulatory reprisal, um, in general, uh, we can be pretty confident that if we're doing the right thing for a patient and we're documenting well, no one's going to be coming after us for this. Um, there were periods of time in, in, uh, in my practice where I had uh, uh, opioid prescribing uh, levels that well exceeded the, the norm for my specialty, according to the state of Michigan. Uh, they didn't come knocking on my door. I wasn't too worried about it because they know what we do. And so uh, right for reprisal should never be a reason that you're not doing the right thing for a patient. Okay, there are some uh, opioid resistant pains that you need to be aware of because um, you will see these um, from time to time, and uh, they may present to you with these things, uh, or they may develop in the course of your care for them. Uh, headaches, muscle spasm, tenesmoid, uh, pain incident to movement and decubitus ulcers. Uh, these um, are, uh, you're, you're going to be disappointed if you try to manage these uh, specific with opioids. Um, with, with headaches, it's not that they will never work or that, but it really depends on the nature of the headaches. It's a very, very, you know, headaches, as you know, is a very complex uh, field and you can't just say one headache and, and expect that to fit everybody. Um, someone who's having uh, muscle tension headaches needs a different uh, strategies for managing those. Uh, those that are having you know, cluster headaches, migraine headaches, other sorts of things uh, need a, a very different approach. And, and it's possible that, that a small amount of opioid may be of some value along the way, but, uh, but in general, uh, we don't want to use uh, opioids to treat headaches. And the same with muscle spasm. We have effective uh, muscle relaxants, and they're actually much better than the opioids. Uh, sometimes with headaches and, and muscle spasm, we give folks opioids, and it, uh, it makes them a little sedated, and they maybe will sleep a little bit better, but we haven't done really anything for the pain. Uh, and there are better ways to give people some rest and sedation than opioids. Uh, people who are having uh, bowel and bladder spasms, again, well, Bentil works great. Uh, other anticholinergic meds can, can help that, and it'll be much more rewarding than using uh, opioids. The last two, the uh, pain incident to movement and decubitus ulcers are challenges that we see um, in um, in the elderly, and they can be challenging. And we've, we've seen a number of attempts to try to be proactive. For example, someone who is, you need to move them for wound care. Um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll give them some uh, tramadol or perhaps some Norco prior to that. And again, it might help them to sleep a little bit, but it doesn't do as much for the pain. Both pain that's incident to movement and pain related to uh, you know, pressure, uh, pressure sores, pressure injury, uh, tend to be neuropathic in nature. So if patients are having that on a consistent basis, uh, we sometimes talk about uh, microdosing of methadone, two and a half milligrams, for example, at night, uh, for someone who is having these pains on a daily basis, uh, could be very, very useful. Um, I think that some of my others uh, for the decubitus ulcers, I, I tend to be a fan of 
um, spritzing some ketamine on there. Uh, ketamine is one of my favorite um, uh, adjuvants and, uh, and works really, really well in that particular circumstance as well. It's a little bit more challenging within the nursing home sit, uh, setting, but, uh, but just keep in mind that some pains don't always respond to that. And just as a caveat here, I know that we're at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to go, I just have another handful of slides. We don't have a case presentation today, so I'm going to go just a little bit longer than usual here for those that can stay on for another five minutes or so. Uh, interventional therapies, um, we're not going to stay here uh, for very long because we're going to have a great lecture coming up uh, later in the series, uh, a whole, whole hour on interventional therapies, which is wonderful. I think that we just, my, my, my take home on this one is to keep in mind that not everything needs a, a prescription of an oral or an IV drug. Uh, there are ways in which trigger point injections, fecal epidural injections, or especially specific types of local blocks can be very, very effective at, uh, at relieving pain. And we need to have those in our consciousness, not buried somewhere, that we may, we may have some advantage um, from these interventional therapies. Physical therapy, I think, is extremely important. Um, sometimes, certainly in, in the um, imminent end of life, um, you know, hospice population is going to be less relevant. But for our palliative patients who are still hoping to be functional, and you know, or patients who are undergoing, for example, you know, active chemotherapy, uh, their physical therapy can have a really important uh, role in that. Uh, tailored exercises really is the heart of therapeutic therapeutic program for most physical therapy. These strengthening exercises in, in therapy, at-home exercise programs, they're tailored to balance weakness and decrease pain. And pretty much anyone can benefit from PT referral if they have pain. It teaches them how to use their body, how to overcome uh, the pain, how to function in spite of it, or to really reduce it. Other sorts of things in terms of direct interventions, massage, Nerve stimulators, ultrasound, they can all be very, very effective. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of physical therapy. And so if you've got someone, especially someone in the chronic pain arena, make sure that physical therapy is part of your recommendation for their therapy. Of course, we can, we can get to even further away and begin talking about uh, self-directed therapies. These are all scientific validated to improve uh, overall well-being and mood. They're not specific just for pain, but they can improve the lives of chronic pain patients as well. And as we've talked before, just the, the, the connection between the, um, our cerebral cortex and our pain experience and in interpreting that, we improve well-being, we improve pain experience. Exercise, not much um, argument there. Uh, yoga and meditation, however, that... Uh, uh, is expressed for you. Uh, gratitude journal, self-hypnosis. I want to spend just a moment on the gratitude journal because that, that's an important uh, piece that I think applies to all of you on the call here and not just to our patients. I've recommended this a lot uh, to folks. And um, uh, that, uh, you know, before your head hits the pillow at night, jot down three things for which you are thankful. Now, there's been studies that have been done about this, and you obviously can be thankful throughout the day. You can obviously think about being thankful, but what the studies have demonstrated, if you actually physically chronicle that, you get better sleep, you wake up feeling more rested, and you have a more productive day the next day. That's what the science tells us. Uh, I just think it's good to be grateful. Uh, the the, the it can be a positive thing, you know, woke up to a beautiful sunrise this morning, or it can be, I'm, I'm thankful that it wasn't raining and that made my trip in easier this morning. But just, I would encourage you all just to, just to try that. You can write it on a napkin, piece of paper, inside a journal book, uh, jot it down on your phone. Duke uh, uh, University actually has uh, an app that you can, you can plug them in there and and they're making a, uh, uh, if, if you're interested, they're making a large uh, repository of what people are grateful for. So a gratitude journal, I rec would recommend it to your patients. I would recommend it to you. Okay. 
advance the slide here. There we go. Um, and then we certainly have a whole a host of non pharmacologic interventions uh, that can be done OMM uh, with, you know, through our osteopathic partners uh, can be very effective at relieving a lot of um, uh, types of pain. Acupuncture, acupressure, massage therapy, I'll just go down the list, uh, music therapy, art therapy, humor therapy, uh, hypnosis, relaxation, reflexology, uh, Reiki, herbal therapy, hypnosis, pet therapy, aromatherapy, chiropractic, Korean hand therapy. Many of these on this list fall into the category of what we might term um, energetics therapy, or sometimes I'll refer to them as Eastern therapies, your acupuncture, acupressure, for example, uh, Reiki, Korean hand therapy, things of that sort. Um, I'm not an expert in any of these. I've dabbled with many of them, music therapy. I've had acupuncture uh, a handful of times. I was trained in Korean hand therapy. So I've, I've had some uh, value there. I've seen the, uh, the importance and value of humor therapy, art therapy, hypnosis, um, uh, and uh, relaxation. So I want to make sure that with, with this slide, we're just, we're, we're keeping in mind that not everything has to be a, uh, a handwritten prescription. I guess we don't handwrite anything anymore, but uh, a, a prescription for a drug. That our patients that are experiencing pain and we're having some challenges in, in, in getting through that with them, that we are, um, that we're, we're looking for options and opportunities to help the whole person and to look at ways other than uh, simply pharmacology at helping to relieve their pain. Someone who's in a pain crisis almost always is going to uh, uh, need some drugs. I wouldn't pop up a Three Stooges movie and expect that's going to, you know, help their acute, uh, you know, post-surgical pain. But, uh, but these things have a role, and I would say especially in those uh, folks that, uh, that are having chronic pain, those that may have some other sort of, uh, uh, you know, psychosocial issues, those that might be isolated, those that might be lonely, uh, can find some value in things like pet therapy and art therapy. And music therapy. So uh, just keep those in mind. Um, I wanted to just share um, uh, just two slides just talking about the opioid epidemic. Um, we don't have a specific lecture planned for non malignant pain at this moment in time. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share with you a couple of thoughts that I had about the issue of our opioid epidemic. We remain in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Tens of thousands of deaths related to opioids occur annually. The vast majority is resulting from the overdose of heroin or other illegal or illicit use of opioids. I just heard another story this morning on the way in about another veterinary drug that is being uh, uh, infused into some of the um, uh, uh, heroin products here. Deaths occurring as a result of monitored use of prescribed opioids are rare. I mentioned that earlier, I emphasize it again here. Deaths occurring as a result of monitored use of prescribed opioids are rare. Inappropriate prescription of opioids for chronic non malignant pain has in part contributed to substance use disorder and may serve as a gateway to escalating opioid use. And we can't be blind to that. 80% um, of people who start using heroin had exposure at some point to pharmaceutical, opi pharmaceutical opiates. They may not have been prescribed by a doctor that could have gotten those off the street too, but it is a gateway. So finally, you know, there really are a number of factors that, that confound our ability to improve the situation. Uh, and I think that uh, all of these are relevant and we have different uh, roles within each one of these. Indiscriminate use of opioids when not indicated is a big one. Physicians not able to recognize substance use disorder. And they're not trained to help patients take and withdraw from opioids when they are not indicated. So I hope in the course of our time within uh, our, our various fellowship programs, we'll have um, exposure to that. and feel comfortable recognizing that and helping patients into a, an effective therapeutic program. 
Inadequate training and appropriate pain management still is an issue. Lack of understanding of the factors that drive individuals to rely on chemical substances to address underlying psychological issues. In my, in my book, that probably is one of the most important bullets on here that, that drives our current opioid crisis is that we don't understand all of the issues that patients are experiencing, that individuals are experiencing, that, that cause them to turn to the opioids uh, for relief of their stress. And then finally, inadequate availability of mental health resource. I think that's been uh, talked about, promoted. So um, 10 minutes over, um, but uh, that's what I've got. I will uh, release the slides here, stop sharing, and see if there are any questions that someone might have, any questions or, or comments. I appreciate the part on the non-pharmacologic, and I, I would encourage us, let's continue to work that into our, like, discussions, case presentations, because, like you said at the beginning, the concept of Tylenol, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you're conditioned to think, well, it's an over-the-counter, so it's a very benign, you know, um, headaches, it's good for headaches or, or very low threshold, but, um, as we start to see and, and maybe experience in ourselves, um, I personally have had um, a surgery. My wife's been through surgery and through what I've learned at this table um, allowed us, I think, to get through both of our surgeries with only Tylenol. We both had, you know, um, other pain meds available that didn't have to use them because of... It's amazing only that's something... 10 years ago, I don't think I would have been able to do that, but through experience and now knowing that. And psychologically. So there's that psychological point, um, and a lot of our recovery was with physical therapy, you know, and things such as that. So I just, I wanna keep stressing that because as we learn and know and experience that ourselves, it makes it a lot easier um, and effective to um, share that with our patients who are, you know, again, as a society, we are trained I have ailment X, so we write, as you say, in the old days, we'd pick up a prescription pad and prescribe this pill. We are the experts in knowing how to manage those meds. Um, but again, philosophically, how do we use those as the adjunct to all the other things you mentioned? Yeah. I wanted to highlight uh, uh, Carol uh, Robinson, uh, with my friends and colleagues uh, worked with a lot, has uh, had, a, had a, a really very appropriate note here. A note based on last week's lecture, as part of the interprofessional team, it's important for nurses to have clear directives on when and how much to medicate according to the patient's perceived level of pain. Although no pain scale is perfect, Department of Defense pain scale includes standardized language of each pain level and addresses biopsychosocial impact of pain. It provides a more complete picture of the patient's pain and helps the nurse determine whether an adjuvant alone is appropriate versus an opioid with an adjuvant. It also helps the nurse determine if the present regimen is working or the need to call the physician or APP for a change in the plan. And I think this is, this is so important. This is so important. Um, we, uh, we sometimes leave a burden to the bedside nurse of determining how much and what to give. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times it's going to be based on, well, what does she like the patient or not like the patient? Does she think the patient is being um, you know, true, is you know, or malingering? Yeah. And so I think that there's a lot of challenges that we sometimes, so I, I really appreciate that, uh, uh, Carol. And I think that maybe what I'll do is um, um, get the, uh, the, the DOD pain scale. I didn't include that last week, but that's a great idea. Um, and just stick that in the, in the folder with the, uh, with the lecture so that people will have access to that. So thanks for recommending that. You will find that that's especially true in assisted livings where uh, they're very loath to, uh, to dispense the medications. And, and the way the, the, in that industry is now, you have uh, medical assistants doing what RNs did once upon a time. So I, it can't be surprising that, that uh, they would have a level of a discomfort with 
uh, with a PRN order. Um, I, John, I had a question too, and Jay, um, within the financing class, um, at some point in time, uh, if the fellows haven't experienced it before, they're gonna write an order for morphine or, or something else, and the patient's going to have a codeine allergy, and the pharmacy is going to flag it and refuse to fill it, and then you're going to wind up in a discussion with them about um, the potential for um, uh, for uh, similar reactions amongst medications in the class. <clears throat> Is there anything you want to say about that? I mean, I see it, I experience it quite frequently, um, but I don't know if you guys do. What's the allergy? Well, that's <laughs> I was going to say, that's, right, that's right. the first question. I get a little loopy at the higher rates. <laughs> yeah. The Benadryl makes me sleep. Yeah, go ahead. Tim. No, I, I, it's it's a challenge. Um, I think that um, uh, you know, I, I think what you're pointing that, that someone is complaining of an allergy to something, so they get some, like, get a different drug. Uh, often, so if you uh, so you're ordering the medication, and suddenly all the wheels stop because the pharmacy calls back or or just doesn't process the order mm -hmm. um, because of the codeine allergy. I, I, uh, I often will say that, um, you know, I'll take the risk. You know, if I don't think, if, if I think the patient needs the drug and there's suspicion as to what that allergy, in quotes, might be, I'm perfectly comfortable. I mean, allergies, true allergies to morphine is extraordinarily rare. Um, the, um, when you talk about allergies to codeine, they usually are the adverse reaction because they do have a relatively high incidence of adverse reaction. Uh, nausea, itching, things of that sort. So those are not allergies. Those are just adverse reactions. Um, and I, I, I worry less about those. Um, so. yeah, I notice uh, there's not a hydroxyl group on codeine, nor is there a hydroxyl group on morphine, which uh, I didn't really think about that until today that I guess um, I, and I rarely see anybody with a codeine sensitivity who doesn't tolerate anything else. Yeah. And the comment what John said, that circumstances will influence a lot, right? Uh, if you're with an imminent patient, uh, what was the first slide to quote? Uh, no patient should um, suffer so much they wish for death to speak. Or not be because of yeah. adequate or opioids, yeah. So especially when we're in more of our hospice phase and end of life, Right. The um, again, asking what is the allergy? What is the reaction in this circumstance? Is it relevant? Uh, sometimes it will be. Sometimes it won't be. Uh, we've had uh, renal failure patients where normally you wouldn't be giving them morphine because of metabolites and whatnot. But depending on where they're at in their journey, it could be appropriate. So. Okay. All right, so I'm going to shut this down now um, and wish everybody a good day. We'll see you all next week and have a great weekend.